recording this uh, for those who will be worshiping online today at 11 o'clock, uh, which I'm hoping will be a, a larger number due to the weather um, and some concerns around coronavirus. Uh, but we continue to offer uh, services and opportunities to grow in our spirit uh, through worshiping of God. And so we're grateful you are here this morning, as well as those who will be wor worshiping with us online later on. I also want to thank uh, those who helped to get our parking lots and sidewalks ready to go. Uh, we are grateful, uh, certainly for Jeff, who just walked in the room, but others I know who were helping him as well, uh, getting everything prepared as best as they could. Uh, this is not an easy task on days like this, but we are grateful for those who helped uh, to prepare space uh, where we can worship God um, in a very real and powerful way. I uh, want to let you know, uh, hopefully you received the announcement, but the concert that we were scheduled to have this afternoon uh, for Ray of Hope has been postponed uh, due to uh, concerns over COVID, uh, both for those who are participating, but also uh, in our larger community. Uh, so we're looking to a future date uh, when numbers are better, uh, looking better, and we can gather a little bit more safely. Uh, so we will not be having the concert this afternoon, but please be in prayer uh, for Ray of Hope and uh, for that concert to uh, happen at a later date. So we are grateful you were here this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand as it's comfortable as uh, we begin worshiping. you now to join me in our call to worship. It'll be found on the screen today as we read responsively. We gather here not because we have seen fit to choose Christ, but because he has looked upon us and called us to be his own. O oh God, you have searched me and know me. You read my every thought from afar. There is not a word on my tongue that you do not know altogether. Some boast of their motor cars and some of their mansions, but we boast of the name of the Lord of hosts. Should all else collapse in a heap, we shall stand up tall. Do not be impressed by the outward appearance of a person, for God does not like what, what does not see like we do, but looks into the heart. If anyone travels with Christ, there is a new creation. Old things are obsolete. All things become new. Let us worship this God who looks into the human heart, and through Christ Jesus makes all things new. Amen. I'm going to move away from the camera for just one second, so if you happen to be online, you can continue to listen to my voice, because I forgot to grab a Bible, um, because my digital Bible is not currently working. Uh, so I need to uh, leave the camera for just one second, but I'm going to keep talking so the people who watch this online will not be uh, crazy and weird. So hello again. Uh, welcome to see you all. Um, our first scripture lesson today uh, comes from the book of 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 14 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 
through 21. And I am almost there. There we go. 2 Corinthians four, uh, 5, 14. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised from the dead. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ for, from a human point of view. We know, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old is passed away. See, everything has been made new. All this is from God who, re who, rec who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May God have his blessing to the reading of this word. Amen. Normally, this is the time where we ask you to select hymns, but for several reasons, we are going to just turn to page 347. Uh, we'll also be on the screen today. Uh, we're going to be uh, singing the Spirit song together, number 347.
of opportunity now to think about uh, the prayers, the things that might be on your hearts today. Uh, but today I want to do that a little bit differently um, and share a few things that are on my heart, but also invite you, uh, if you have things that are on your heart, uh, to write those things down so I and the congregation may be praying for those um, this week. Um, it's been a complicated and difficult week for lots of reasons, and so I want to share a few of those reasons and thoughts with you uh, that you might be able to be in prayer, uh, not just for me, but for our congregation, for our community, um, and for ever, several other aspects. So um, on Thursday of this week, I had opportunity to gather at the school uh, for a community meeting, and the idea of that community meeting is to respond or to figure out ways uh, that we could respond to uh, some of the despair that we're seeing uh, throughout our school, uh, particularly in the high school, but other uh, schools are certainly uh, facing uh, what I would just call a, a, a problem of despair amongst our students, our teachers, our staff. Um, it's been a very complicated and difficult couple of years, obviously, uh, trying to navigate through COVID, uh, and that has uh, just created many other issues and problems. Um, so we want to just be in prayer uh, for those who are gathering to think about and figure out how we can work together uh, with the school administrators, counselors, teachers, uh, medical staff were a part of that, pastors were a part of that meeting. Um, it was a very productive and helpful meeting. I was very pleased to be a part of it. Uh, but one of the things I did leave uh, that meeting knowing or figuring out um, is just being overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the task of, of trying to uh, help our students, our community uh, find some hope in the midst of a very complicated and difficult situation. Um, so I know that's a lot of uh, just kind of 10,000 foot kind of view stuff, uh, but I just want to ask your prayers uh, for this particular group that's gathering uh, to try to tackle this issue, uh, but also our community in general who just has a sense of despair. Uh, also, uh, something that kind of came up at the tail end of the week. We've been working on this concert that I mentioned uh, for Ray of Hope. Um, and the idea was uh, a couple of fold. Uh, one is that because of the challenge of the last couple of years, um, needing and finding opportunities uh, to gather together for fellowship, worship, uh, lifting of our spirits. And so that was kind of the, the first goal of this concert. Uh, the second goal, of course, was to support and help Ray of Hope who uh, does a lot of great work in our, in our community and has been for a number of years. Um, so both tasks were really helpful in, in wanting us to do that. Uh, but one of the things that kind of first part of the conversation happened on Thursday through this community meeting, but then some further conversations that happened on Friday, um, really discovered, a, really came to a realization that's been out there. Uh, but in terms of uh, the number of COVID cases and the uh, overwhelming um, strain that's placed on our medical staff at this moment, both our hospitals and our doctor's offices, um, we decided that it was probably a good idea to postpone that event uh, to, uh, to try to mitigate as much as possible large numbers of people gathering together. As I was talking with a couple of different people over this decision, um, uh, the other thing that became very clear to me in those conversations is uh, what should happen with worship. And so um, one of the things that I personally uh, have struggled with in terms of just this week, but also throughout this whole pandemic, is what's the best way to uh, be a congregation? How do we come together, support each other, encourage one another, be lifted up, uh, but also utilize the tools that are at our hands with our digital technology um, and those kinds of things? And so uh, throughout that, uh, throughout the last couple of days as we were talking about this, um, we uh, decided to cancel the concert, but continue with worship. And so I just want to uh, be very clear uh, that I completely understand uh, the contradiction of those two decisions um, and understand the weight of what that looks like. Um, and so, yes, I believe there's different factors with both of those events, both having church and having the concert. Uh, there's also some similarities, numbers of people gathering together in one space. Um, and so uh, we do plan on continuing to do um, our, our part to separate as much as possible, uh, clean during the week, uh, doing the things we can uh, to do our best, but also uh, to advise people uh, that if they feel unsafe for whatever reason, we continue to have our digital option um, and want people to remain safe um, as much as possible. So that's a whole lot of stuff, um, and I just felt like I wanted to share my heart uh, with what kind of is happening in my mind, my heart, 
um, and the things we're challenged with um, in today's world. Um, because um, I know speaking to a couple of our medical staff uh, from the hospital and the doctor's offices, um, they are completely, utterly worn out, exhausted, overwhelmed. Um, and so I know I don't want to be a part of continuing to put more strain on them. Um, so I hear that. I know that. I shared that with them. Um, and I just want you to know I feel that too. Uh, so trying to navigate this is complicated at best. Um, and I'm trying to do, and we are trying to do the best we can um, as a congregation. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you today. All right. I think that's what I had. But again, if you have things you want to share, I invite you to write those down. If you happen to be watching this online, uh, I invite you to share those in the comments. We check that at a later date. Um, and we'll be putting those on our prayer list. So uh, let us go to God in prayer today. Oh, good, gracious, and awesome God. I thank you for the opportunities we have to gather for worship, whether it be in person or online. God, unite us together. Pull us together. Help us to be focused on what you want us to be focused on. Lord, as Jesus walked this earth, his first pri priority was people. He saw people who were lost and alone, people who were sick and harassed. Scripture tells us that they were like sheep without a shepherd, and so he stood up, and he became their shepherd. He told us he is the good shepherd, and Lord, we thank you for his continued love for us, for seeking us, showing us his way, his truth, and his life. Lord, help us today to hear you. Help us to know you. God, we pray for our community. We pray, Lord, specifically for our high school, our middle school our elementary school, our, vota our vocational technical school. God, we ask that you put your spirit upon each and every person that walks in those buildings. Lord, help them to hear and to know that you are watching over them, that your love is real, and that your love can be shown in a thousand different ways. Lord, help us who are praying in this day to be the ones who reach out, to share how much you are in love with us and with those who are yet to hear, know, or remember. God, we pray for our doctors, for our nurses, for our researchers, for our administrative leadership in all areas of our lives. Lord, may you give them wisdom, give them knowledge, give them energy to keep fighting. We thank you for all that they've done and all they continue to do to try to keep us healthy. Lord, there are so many questions. So many things we just don't understand. Lord, help us to stop fighting. Stop fighting and start building each other up. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, Lord. Help us to care for one another in a way that brings your heart and your life to full measure. And Lord, we pray all of this in the amazing name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second scripture lesson today comes from the book of Ephesians. And uh, Roscoe, I'm going to skip over the offering, so uh, I apologize for, for not telling you that a minute ago. Uh, we will do the offering later, but I'll tell you how to do that, how we're going to do that. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to go to the book of Ephesians as we continue our series on Ephesians. This is our second week, and we're going to go into the second chapter. And so if you're following along um, in this sermon uh, series, it's going to be six weeks long. We have six chapters in Ephesians, so we're going to talk about one chapter a week. Doesn't that work out nicely? I love when things like that happen. So today we're in chapter two, and we're going to look specifically at verses one through nine. So I invite you to hear this word of God from Ephesians chapter two. Beginning in verse 1. You were dead through your transgressions, uh, through your trespasses and sins in which you once lived, 
following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in, this pa- in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of our flesh and senses. We, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else, but God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love, out of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us, seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the age to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of the works so that no one may boast. For we are are what we are made of. Let me try that again. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand for our good life. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Amen. Now Clayton is at our streaming computer today, and so Clayton, I'm going to tell you something different. I'm actually going to stay right here so you can keep the camera on me uh, for our message today. And I invite you uh, to join me in a word of prayer as we prepare for that message today. Oh, good, gracious, and awesome God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have eyes that will see, ears that will listen, minds that will comprehend what you want for us today. Help us to hear this word from Ephesians as a reminder of who we are in you. Lord, remind us of the grace by which we stand, the grace that has saved us from sin and death and made us alive with you. God, help us to embrace life in all its uncertainty, but also with all of its many pleasures and joys that come straight from you. Lord, remind us, God, today that when we seek pleasure in another way, it only becomes empty. Help us to find our hope, our fulfillment, our joy only in you. Lord, it is in Jesus' name we pray, and I ask that you never allow me to do my thing in your people And may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. As I was preparing for today's message, I was looking over my sermon again last night, and I came to a realization. I came to a realization that it is interesting uh, that when we are in the midst of winter, I like to tell stories about the summer. And when we're in the summertime... I usually like to get at least one story about winter, just a realization, I don't know why that is. But today, I want to begin the message uh, by sharing with you a story about a Little League baseball game. You can imagine the scene. Beautiful spring, summer day, it's warm outside, the grass is green, the flies are buzzing around, the birds are chirping, the sun is shining, and the baseball players are at their positions. Fielders and hitters. In this particular game, the game had been intense the entire time, going back and forth. It was the bottom of the final inning. The umpire had said this was the last at bat. And so the team at bat was behind by a couple of runs, and they were able to uh, get the bases loaded but had two outs. And finally, stepping to the plate was a young man by the name of Carl. Now this is not an autobiographical story, even though the name of the character happens to be your pastor. And so the Little League uh, game, the fans were intense, both on the offensive side and the defensive side. Those who were for the defense were cheering for every pitch, hoping that the young man at the plate would strike out in humiliation. But those who were for the offensive side were cheering Carl on trying best to get him to concentrate and hit the ball. He only needed a hit to score two runs, and they would win the game. So finally, the last inning, the last time, two outs, bases loaded. Carl would either be the winner who would decide the game or the loser that would lose the game. Carl had a large family watching. 
his mom, his dad, his brothers, his sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents. It seemed like half the crowd was for Carl, cheering him on. The pitcher looked into the plates, wound up, pitched the pitch. Carl swung with all of his might. Strike one. The energy in the crowd was palpable. Carl stepped out of the box for just one moment, stepped back in, looked squarely in the pitcher's eyes, and the pitcher looked back at him, wound up, threw the pitch straight to the plate. Carl swung again with all of his might. Everybody stopped, held their breath as the catcher caught strike number two. The crowd really was into this now. Two strikes, two outs, bottom of the last inning, bases loaded. This could be the end or a grand uh, fi finale for those who were at the plate. The crowd was yelling, support and ridicule. Strike out the bum, one would say. Another would say, he's not a bum, he's my son. Carl was intense. The pitcher wound up through again. He knew he could be the hero or the loser. The ball came in. It seemed as if time slowed down. The ball seemed to be on a string coming straight towards the plate. Carl looked, licked his lips, brought his bat back ready to swing. And finally, as he put his bat through the zone, missed the ball. Strike three. The winning team went crazy. The dugout emptied. Fans swarmed the field uh, in grand celebration. Everyone having their own kind of party about the victory that just had happened. However, Carl remained dejected at the plate as his team cleared the dugout and headed to the parking lot. Carl just remained there in the batter's box. Bat by his side, dejected, in pain that he had lost the game for his team. As he was standing there, he heard a voice yell, Come on, Carl, pick up the bat. Grandpa's now pitching. Bewildered, Carl slowly picked up his bat and swung at Grandpa's first pitch. He missed yet again. And he missed the next six pitches as well. But on the eighth pitch... He got hold of the ball and sent it far out into the field. His aunt ran and picked up the ball and threw it to first base with plenty of time to get Carl out. But the first baseman, played by mom, somehow must have lost the ball in the sun and the ball got away from her. Run, everyone yelled. And Carl began to run to second base. As the first baseman recovered the ball and threw over to second, amazingly, Uncle uh, David, who was also in the field playing second base, also uh, miraculously lost the ball in the sun. See the irony of that play, right? Ball going this way, lost the ball in the sun. Ball going that way, ball lost in the sun. Wanted to make sure you caught that. Everyone kept running. Keep running, keep running. Carl goes to third base. Uncle David finds the ball, throws it over to... Uh, grandma who's at third base and somehow grandma just couldn't grab the ball finally Carl turns the corner runs for home and he slides in as his brother narrowly misses the tag at home plate he is safe before he knew it what was happening Carl found himself up on the shoulders of his uncle David and everyone shouting and cheering Carl's name he was now the hero of his family. One person watching this whole business said, I just watched a little boy fall victim to the conspiracy of grace. Carl, who would have been left with an awful memory of his failure, was instead given a memory of grace, love, and acceptance. My friends, this is what Ephesians is all about. It wants us to understand and know grace that is made visible. Grace is truly amazing. But if and only when we experience it. When grace is relegated to a nice, trite statement in a sermon, grace loses its meaning, power, and hope. We need a grace that is made visible. 
When we read Ephesians, we see grace come to life. Last week, we talked about chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians, which introduces uh, the God of grace. It focuses on praise of God for showering, showering, us, for showering us with his grace in Christ. It gives us an appreciation of the grace given by the, uh, by the Ephesians as they express their gratitude for being chosen by God. It tells of how they were people who were known for uh, their faith shown in action in the world. The author of Ephesians says in chapter 1 that I give thanks to God for the ways that you show God to the world. It also mentions in chapter 1 the authority of Christ, that all things are under him who is grace personified. That when, when we want to know what grace is, what grace looks like, we only have to look into the eyes of God. Look into the eyes of Christ who stayed with us and for us. Today we look at chapter 2. And chapter 2 begins in a most interesting way. It begins with a statement about our before. Now I love before and after stories. I love seeing transformation uh, come to life. Transformation truly is incredible. With seeing someone who was once one way, but then became another, or a space that was uh, dilapidated and worn out, but became renewed, became transformed through the work of interior designers and construction workers. It can be inspiring to see these transformational stories, or I also admit that sometimes when I see these transformational stories, it can become daunting. It can become inspirational knowing that, hey, I can do that. If they can do that, I can too. Or it can become daunting because after I get that inspiration, I realize that the work and the hard effort that it takes. Most of the time when we see these transformation stories, we see these stories um, as they, not as they are, but in short form. Just think about it. The television programs we watch or uh, things we come across on the internet um, are typically less than five minutes long, or if you're really good, uh, you might be able to stay engaged for an entire hour program uh, with a commercial break every 12 minutes. Okay, you with me? So most of the time we see the transformation that happens over a very short amount of time, anywhere from five minutes to 45 minutes, um, and we can stay engaged in that, uh, but we don't see the long hours and painful struggles that took place in order to get them there. When I was uh, in high school, I had a basketball coach who was fond of saying, all victories, every single championship is won in practice. All victories are won in practice. Certainly in my opening stories, we, uh, opening story, we thought about Carl uh, being the loser. He didn't lose that game. Yes, he missed some pitches. He uh, wanted to be the, the hero of that. But so many things happened both in that game, before that game, in order to build up to this one moment. All victories are won in practice. All transformation is done in process. It doesn't just take place. It doesn't just end. And so when Ephesians chapter 2 talks about our before, it also anticipates our future. Ephesians chapter 2, as for you, it says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. This was your before. You were dead. You were dead in your transgressions, transgressions and sins in which you used to live because you followed the ways of the world. Because you did the things that led you to death. This is why you received that. But verse 3, all of us also lived among those folks who lived that way, craving uh, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts, our desires and thoughts. But like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. We were able to see our before. But what Ephesians wants us to understand is that that was our before, not our after. Before and after, your before and after does not have to be complicated. It is simply sharing from your heart, what God has done for you and leaving the results up to God. I want to share with you the story of Spud Webb. He was five, five foot six inches tall. 
Spud was like the Zacchaeus of the NBA, where the average height was 6'8 to 6'9 when he played. Since then, it's gotten even taller, stronger, and broader. Spud Webb played for nine years in the NBA. Despite a successful high school career, no major college or university offered him a scholarship. So Spud attended a little two -year, the little two-year Midland College and helped lead his team to the National Junior College Championship. North Carolina State decided to give him a chance, and he led the Wolfpack to the Sweet 16 performance in the NCAA tournament. When he graduated from college, nobody in the NBA thought he ever had a chance to play in their league. He did okay in college, but they would say in the NBA he has no chance. Too small. Finally, the Atlanta Hawks gave him the opportunity to play. In his first four seasons he played for Atlanta, the Hawks went to the playoffs four times. Perhaps one of the greatest moments of Spud Webb's career came in, on February 8th of 1986. That's when the annual NBA slam dunk contest occurred. Competing against players who were over a foot taller than he was, Spud Webb won the slam dunk contest at five foot six inches tall. Spud gave the following testimony. I used to pray that the Lord would make me bigger when I was in junior high school and senior high school, but every time I went to measure myself or stand in front of the mirror, I'd always be the same size. And then, one day, I got the message. So I said, Lord, if you won't make me bigger on the outside, will you make me bigger on the inside? And the Lord liked the prayer, liked that prayer. And that's what helped me become. We were dead, but... God did not see us there or keep us there. We were dead in our transgressions and sins, but God chose to do something different. So please listen to verse 4. But because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. The book of Ephesians, again, over and over, wants to make grace visible, wants to help us understand uh, that we once were before, but now we are after. He wants to raise us up, not by our own efforts and our own work, but the fact that he ignites something in us, that he builds us up, that he makes us well. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. I read a story this week of a gentleman who was visiting uh, the country of Italy. And while in Italy, um, he visited the site of Mount Vesuvius, a, a volcano that had erupted and uh, created great damage throughout the area and region. And while visiting Mount Vesuvius, he discovered something very interesting, that when a volcano erupts, um, hot, molten rock, uh, rock that becomes uh, liquefied, essentially, comes spewing out of the earth, um, and it flows uh, down the sides of mountains and hills and gets on anything and everything. But the interesting thing about this molten rock that comes out uh, from below the earth is that once uh, it flows, it cools, and its power is finished. The power of a volcanic eruption is incredible. It's amazing. But once it is done, it is done. And the reason this is interesting is because this man uh, talked about his story, but he also compared it to another uh, uh, earthen substance uh, that seems very similar but has a very different property. He says, imagine uh, this uh, volcanic rock that has once was uh, fiery and destructive but now has lost its power. It's done its thing. And then he held up a lump of coal that looks very similar, but inside the coal there is power. That once it is ignited, it can do many things. It can fuel um, our lives. It can uh, create uh, the heat and maintain the heat uh, that we need in order to uh, build each other up. Something wonderful happens. God makes us alive in Christ. When it looks like we're dead like lava rock, he makes us alive like coal. It allows us to see and understand the power of God. The next two verses are kind of the crux of what I want you to remember today. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, it says, God raised us up with Christ 
and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming of ages we might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It tells us that God raised us up in Christ. We need to be raised up because we are way too beaten down. Have you felt that? Have you known that? I know that in my life and in my experience over the last several months and years, it feels like everywhere I turn, there's something or someone that wants to knock me down. There is something or a situation or a circumstance that I don't understand, I don't know how to handle, and it just beats me down even more. I find myself a very positive person and always try to see the bright side of things. But I admit to you, my friends, that it's, it's hard. It's hard to always be that positive person. It's hard to always uh, be the one who sees the silver lining when too often uh, the parade that I'm trying to lead is rained on. But then I look at Ephesians chapter 2 and understand that it doesn't have to be me who leads the band. It doesn't have to be me who uh, champions the fight and the battle because God has already done it. He raises us up. We need to be raised up. Not only that, but we need to raise each other up because I know I find myself as well looking and finding times and opportunities where instead of lifting someone else up and trying to understand, walking a mile in their shoes, I just look at the outside, look at what they've said and what they've done and beat them down anyway. He raised us up. Verse 7 says, in order that in the coming of ages, we might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Point of Ephesians chapter 2 is that we were dead, but Christ has made us alive. We were beaten down, but we were raised up all because of grace. But this grace was not meant to stop with us. It was meant to be passed along, passed along to someone else. So how does this happen? How are we raised up? Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, but it is the gift of God. Not by work so that no one can boast. We lift it up because of God. In the first passage I read for you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 is the crux of that particular, cha particular uh, section that I read for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We no longer know people from an old point of view. We now know them from a new point of view. We need to be raised up. We need to be set free. And so I want to conclude by telling you one final story. Harry Houdini had a problem. The famed escape artist found himself in a jail cell that he couldn't get out of. His mind began to wander back to the challenge he made. Any jail cell, he claimed, couldn't hold him. That's until now. Thirty minutes had gone by since the heavy metal doors swung shut behind him. After an hour, he was still working uh, with, concealed piece of with a concealed piece of metal that was hidden in his belt. Bathed in sweat and panting in exasperation, he could not get, to the, tumbler get the tumblers to move. There was something different about this lock, something he had never experienced before. Finally, after laboring for two hours, Houdini collapsed to the floor in frustration and failure. He couldn't figure it out. He had never been beaten before. All he could do is wait for his ultimate embarrassment. He hung his head in shame. But as he did, something miraculous happened. As he, uh, when he hung his head, he instinctively leaned against the heavy metal door, and it swung open. The door. The door was never locked. It was just closed. The door had been open the entire time. For Houdini, his mind was overruled. His mind overruled the physical. His mind was locked, and that was all that it took to keep him from opening the door and walking out of the jail, jail cell. 
My friends, we are in a state of prison. We are locked up in our own thoughts, our own sin. But Christ has opened the door. All we have to do is walk through. Be raised up today. Be set free. Know the grace of God. Let's pray. Oh, good, gracious, and awesome God, I thank you so much for your love for us. I thank you for coming to a place where we can see and know you. Lord, help us to see your grace this week. Lord, make your grace visible so that we may also show your grace to the world, to point it out, to show it off, and to help people to see your love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to conclude by singing number 365, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. I invite you to stand if it's comfortable, and uh, let's sing together. 365. privilege to have each and every one of you in worship today, and I invite you to receive this as your benediction. Go now in peace, and may the peace of God go with us. May the power of God sustain us, and may we be raised up by the grace of God this week. Amen.